Hello and thank you so much for joining us today for the webinar It's no longer a pain in the neck or back. We would like to thank Dr. James Tang for being with us today and our sponsor for making this lecture possible. Please take note of any questions and comments you have during the lecture as they will be addressed by the doctor at the end of the presentation. Without any further delay, please help me welcome the expert himself, James Tang. Hello. Everyone, a very warm welcome from Newcastle upon Tyne in the United Kingdom. My name is James. I am a general dental practitioner working in County Durham. I'm also a person trainer, sport massage therapist, and a corrective exercise specialist. What I do is to help people to address the muscle imbalance issue, which, as I'm going to explain in a moment, are one of the most common causes of neck and lower back pain. Now, I've experienced a wide range of dental equipment brands over the years and have always regarded cable particularly highly in terms of quality, economics, and operational performance. So I'm delighted to work with cable on this particular webinar. As I'm currently working as an associate um, in a dental corporate, I don't have any power to make any buying decisions. But I have worked with cable equipment in the past and I have no hesitation in highlighting the features of the tools and equipment to make the daily work of the clinical team more comfortable. And I'm going to share some of this with you in the next hour. Now, what we are trying to do today is that it has been estimated that 80% of dentists suffer back and neck pain in the career. And I would like to take this opportunity to explain to you the most common causes of this condition and how it can be prevented. What we try to achieve in the next hours are recognizing the severity and symptoms in causes of musculoskeletal disorders, understand why good posture is important to prevent these disorders, learn tips to help improve workplace posture, and to find out how ergonomically designed dental equipment can reduce the prevalence of musculoskeletal pain. Now, even if you're not suffering from back or neck pain at the present moment, prevention is always better than cure. And I would like to demonstrate to you that these conditions are preventable and the presentation is therefore relevant to everyone. And I hope you will benefit from the information provided. Firstly, let's take a look at the basis of musculoskeletal pain. Firstly, it is important to understand that the human movement system consists of the muscular system, skeletal system, as well as the nervous system. Throughout the body, muscles work in synchrony, and rarely does one single muscle work without other muscle contributing. And it is also important for you to understand the functioning of the body is an integrated and multidimensional system. And if there's impairment in one system, it will lead to compensation and adaptation in another system, thereby initiating a cumulative injury cycle. And we're going to talk about this a little bit later. Through the cumulative injury cycle, we're going to get neck or back pain. Let's take a look at the most common causes of lower back pain. We can have intra-abdominal disorders. That is what we call somatic referred pain, pain that is felt in the spine, but it is from a non-spinous origin, for example, kidney stones. It can be degeneration of intervertebral disc, which can be associated with herniation of disc, which can take many forms, bulge, protrusion, or extrusion. Sciatica, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, which can be a result of aging or previous back injury. Osteomyelitis, cancer that can spread to the spine from another part of the body, most commonly lung, colon, breast, and prostate. Most back pain, however, are caused by musculoskeletal origin, and we're going to concentrate on this tonight. Now, if you are unlucky enough to have back or neck pain, how do you know if you have got serious spinal injury or not? Well, if your pain persists for more than six weeks, it's constantly intense, or if it is getting worse, it's definitely worth further investigation. Now, I'm trying to make this webinar as interactive as possible. If you have back pain or had back pain in the past, can you send me a message? Please let me know if you have back pain in the past.
it's interesting to find out that so many of you have suffered from back pain in the past. Right. Well, let's talk about the characteristic of musculoskeletal back pain. The pain varies with time and physical activities. It's usually stiff on the morning, but after you have been moving around a bit, it gets better. It doesn't affect general health. So, for example, you're not going to have any weight loss. Usually present between the age of 20 to 55. It is caused by muscle dysfunction. We're going to talk about this a little bit later with no specific pathology. That means there's no herniation of disc or nerve compression. The majority of sufferers, including myself, tend to have recurrent symptoms because this type of pain is associated with trigger points. And although the acute episode of pain settled down after a week or so, even without treatment, the pain may not fully subside. And it is therefore important that you don't just cure the pain, but to manage it correctly. Let's talk about the most common causes of musculoskeletal pain. It includes muscle imbalances and core dysfunction. Of course, there are other causes such as traumas for injury, emotional stresses, lack of exercises, smoking. It's worth noting that tendons do not recover well in the presence of nicotine. But the main causes are muscle imbalances and core dysfunction, and we're going to take a look at these two separately in more detail now. So what does it mean by muscle imbalance? It basically means that some muscles are shortened or tight, and some are lengthened and stretched. In both cases, the muscles are weakened, and the muscles are more susceptible to damage, fatigue, or injury when they are weak. So what causes muscle imbalance? Why, why do we have muscle imbalances? The most common cause is poor posture. For example, habitually bending forward, protracting your shoulder when you treat our patients. You may have developed some poor postural habit without even realizing it, but your body will adapt to it, and that will cause muscle imbalance. Obesity, shifting the center of gravity forward, causing an anterior pelvic tilt. Prolonged sitting or sedentary lifestyle. Poor sitting posture, slouching on the chair or crossing your legs when you sit. Incorrect training strategy. Muscle imbalance are also seen in the gym when people focus on certain muscle groups more than others. When muscle on one side is stronger than the muscle on the other side, you have muscle imbalance. And the stronger muscle pull that part of the body out of position and the whole body end up adapting and compensating, ultimately leading to postural dysfunction. A good example of this is people overemphasize over training the chest, shoulder, and the bicep, leading to hyperkyphosis, that's the posture, or the forward head posture, as well as a round shoulder. And we're going to talk about this posture in a little bit more detail later. Now, the next most common cause of musculoskeletal uh, disorder is core dysfunction. Why do we have core dysfunction? because of lack of use of the core musculature, because we're sitting on a stable surface all the time, leading to gradual weakening of these core muscles. In a healthy back, the core muscles contract together to support the spine, and dysfunction of this muscle will lead to lower back pain. So you must have heard a lot of people talking about the core. What exactly is it? I bet you think it is a six pack, which is the rectus abdominis, but it isn't. The definition of the core is the ability of your trunk to support your limbs during functional activities, allowing your muscle and joint to perform in the safest, strongest, and the most efficient position. The core is not just one group of muscle. It is in fact the effective and coordinated contraction of three layers of muscle from the deep, middle, and the outer layer that determine the level of core function. Why is good posture so important? Now, I'm going to explain to you why this is so important. The severity of the problem, over a third of the amount paid by the Dentist Providence Society in claims to dentists are for musculoskeletal conditions. In 2015, this reached nearly 1.5 million. In 2016, it was over 1.4 million. And they have around 250 new claims for musculoskeletal condition every single year. However, most of this problem 
can be prevented. Now, let me give you some examples. In 2014, a member in his early 40s was off work for three months when he suffered from his back pain. They paid him over 11,000 pounds. In 2015, a member in his late 30s suffered from musculoskeletal disorder and paid him over 12,000 pounds for three months while he was off work. In 2016, a member dentist in his late 20s fractured his right leg and received over 3,000 pounds from dentist Providence for three months he was off work. A member dentist in his early 40s suffered from sciatica and he was off work for 10 months while he recovered and the dentist Providence Society paid him over 23,000 pounds in that time. And we need to understand that sciatica can be caused by muscle imbalances and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Now, it is very important to prevent these musculoskeletal disorders because the effect of such disorder can be profound. For instance, you can have discomfort in your lower back and neck, decrease in work performance, inability to perform certain tasks such as bending down to pick something up from the floor because of the stiff back, time off work, meaning loss of earning, limitation of movement or disability. For example, stiff neck preventing you from turning your head to look over your shoulder. It can be dangerous, especially when you're driving. It can even mean the end of your career because you're unable to perform dentistry because of severe back or neck problem. So, how can we prevent musculoskeletal back and neck pain? Then? It can be prevented through an awareness of poor posture. You need to know what is the best posture to adopt at work. And you also need to know the causes of musculoskeletal problems. And if you're already suffering from neck or back pain, you need to have a holistic management, holistic rectification strategy, because it is not good enough just to manage the acute episode of pain. You need to manage your condition effectively. You need to get in touch with me for more details if you want to have more details. Last but not least, improvement of work economics by selecting a good dental unit from a reputable manufacturer, such as cable. Now let's talk about prolonged sitting. We have been talking about the uh, detrimental effect of sitting. Why is it bad? In order to explain why sitting is bad, it is important for you to understand that muscle adaptive position that we put them in. Although the body is efficient in adapting to the need that we place on it, these adaptation can lead to muscle imbalances and tissue damage. So the longer we hold them in certain position, the more tissue adaptation occurs. Tissue can therefore be adaptively shortened or lengthened depending on the position. And this is because our body are not designed to maintain the same body position or engage in fine hand movement hours after hours, day after day. But unfortunately, Dentists often cannot avoid prolonged static posture. Human beings are four-limbed animals, and like our cousin, we are designed to move around and hunt for food. And I'm sure if you put a gorilla in a chair all day, it will get that back too. Now to understand this further, let's take a look at how muscle functions in more detail. We have been talking a lot about muscle dysfunction. What does it actually mean? It means that there's no pathology, but the muscles is not contracting properly or applying the right amount of force during contraction. Now, in order to understand how you get back or neck pain, we first need to understand muscle work synergistically, but not independently. Rarely does one single muscle work without other muscle contributing. Let's take a look at the various functional roles of muscle contraction. Let's take a look. Example of a bicep curl. Okay, during a bicep curl, we'll have the agonist, which is the prime mover that contract to cause the desired action. In this particular case, you have the bicep contraction to create the flexion of the arm. You have the antagonist. In this case, it is the opposite muscle that relax. That is the triceps in this case. We have the synergist muscle that contract to help. These are helper muscles to help the prime mover. And during a bicep curl, the synergies are the brachialis and the brachioradialis. Now, please remember this term synergies. 
as you will learn about how synergies muscle of the lower back contribute to lower back pain later. Now, we also have the fixator that contract to stabilize that part of the body that remain fixed. In the case of bicep curl, it will be the shoulder musculature, the deltoid, and so on, that uh, 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 support uh, 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 the fixation of the shoulder. Just a bit of extra information for you uh, about your resistance training. We have mentioned before that muscle imbalances are seen in the gym when people focus on certain muscle group more than the others. It is therefore important when you train the agonist, that is when you train the prime mover, you need to train the antagonist as well. So if you're training the bicep, you need to train the tricep. If you're training the chest, you need to train the latit latissimal dorsi, the back. When you do um, uh, abdominal crunches, you need to work your back by doing back extension. When you're working the crotchal set, you need to work your hamstring as well, and so on and so forth. Now, if you'd like me to take a look at your training program, please send me a message later. Let me introduce you to another concept of reciprocal inhibition. This basically describes the process where muscle on one side of the joint relaxing to allow the contraction on the other side of the joint. Through the rule of reciprocal inhibition, when one muscle shortens, its antagonist will always lengthen. If you have a muscle that is constantly shortened in a given context, the antagonist will be lengthened within that context. And this is one way of thinking how a tight muscle can inhibit the function of its counterpart. And this applies to all the muscle in the body. So when you do a bicep curl, the antagonist tricep will have to relax to allow the bicep to contract. Well, you are going to ask, what has it got to do with back pain? Now, let's take a look at this. If you sit down all day, that means your hip is, your hip is in a flexed position all the time. Now, let's introduce you to my friend here. Your hip in a flexed position all the time. That means your hip flexors are going to be in a contracted state all the time. And the antagonist for the hip flexion is the gluteus gluteal muscle, the gluteus maximus and the gluteus medius. They are going to be swooshed off through reciprocal inhibition. The glute muscles are very important for hip stabilization and hip extension. Hip extension means this, when the hip, when, when your leg goes back. Okay, so every time when you're walking or running, you leave, need hip extension. So, because the prime mover is not working, other muscle, the synergies, will be taking over. This is what we call synergistic dominance. Let's take a look at this. We already know that muscle work in groups because movement occurs through a coordinated contraction of the number of muscle around the joint. When the prime mover is not contracting properly, then the brain will look for an alternative solution to create the same movement, resulting in the healthy muscle, the synergistic muscle, taking over the role of the prime mover. This is what we call synergistic dominance. But this is only a temporary solution to ensure the correct movement occurs. Synergies are not designed to be agonist and they're less efficient. And over time, this can lead to injury, resulting in this cumulative injury cycle, starting with tissue inflammation, development of trigger points, tissue adhesion, alteration of neuromuscular control, tight muscle due to development of trigger points and certain muscle being tight and certain muscle being weakened. These lead to muscle imbalances, causing other muscle to take over. And this becomes a vicious circle, hence the cumulative injury cycle. Let me just reiterate the example of synergistic dominance. If you sit for a prolonged period of time, it will alter the length tension relationship of the hip flexors and the glutes. The hip flexors become tight and opposing muscle, the glutes become turned off through reciprocal inhibition. When hip extension or stabilization is required, the glutes are not able to function properly. Other muscles take over the piriformis, the erector spinae, the kibble, hamstring, and the laps at the back take over. This is what we call synergistic dominance, where the helper muscle taking over the role of the prime mover. Remember, synergies are not 
as efficient as agonists, and over time, this can lead to development of trigger points in this synergist muscle, which can result in lower back pain. So synergistic dominance is the main cause of musculoskeletal lower back pain. Now, this is, of course, an oversimplification of what can happen with prolonged sitting. It is more complicated if you sit with poor posture. For example, if you slouch on the chair, you will have a, a hyperkyphotic posture with a posterior pelvic tilt. If you sit with cross legs or if you sit with extensive lumbar extension, that will cause an anterior pelvic tilt. Now the list go on and on and we don't have time to go through every single scenario. But I'm merely giving you an overview of effect of prolonged sitting and the effect of poor posture uh, uh, on, the, on the muscle attached to the pelvis. Let's briefly take a look at postural dysfunction. What is postural dysfunction? Now, throughout any given day, we all spend a lot of time in certain positions. For example, sitting in a chair at work, treating patients or doing paperwork. Posture typically refer to how we position our body as a whole. Good posture indicates a certain positioning in which the spinal curves remain neutral, that is not bent forward, backward or sideways. If one of your posture put your spine out of its natural alignment, your muscle will adapt and become unbalanced. This is what we call postural dysfunction. And let's explore this a little bit further now. So, why is it so important to maintain a neutral spine? The spine has four natural curves in the sagittal plane, that is when you view from the side. First of all, you have the cervical lordosis, and then you have the thoracic kyphosis, the lumbar lordosis, and the sacral kyphosis. In a neutral position, the spine is supported mostly by the bony structure resting on top of one another. When these curves become either exaggerated or flattened, the spine increasingly depends on muscles, ligaments, and soft tissue to maintain erect, causing tension in these structures, leading to neck and lower back strain and formation of trigger points. Over time, this can even lead to spinal disc injury. Now, I'm not too sure if you're familiar with the term trigger points, but they affect a muscle by keeping it both tight and weak, thus restricting blood and lymphatic circulation in its immediate vicinity, resulting in accumulation of metabolic byproducts and deprivation of nutrients and oxygen. These can perpetuate trigger points for a very, very long time. And they are not acupuncture points, by the way, because you can actually touch them and feel them with your fingers. Trigger points, either active or latent trigger points, can easily be located. They are always very painful to press on. Latent trigger points can become active through very little stress or strain. Please note that trigger points are not the same as muscle spasm, by the way. Muscle spasm involves the entire muscle, and trigger points are contraction within a muscle fiber. The problem is that trigger points won't disappear unless you intervene, or they can refer pain to another place. But once you know where to look, they can easily be located and be deactivated using myofascial release techniques. For example, neck pain is commonly referred from trigger points in the upper back or, and the shoulder. Of particular relevance to dentistry, common example of referred pains are tension headache, TNJ dysfunction, or even toothache from the masseter and the temporalis trigger points. Let's take a look at the first uh, postural dysfunction, hyperlordosis. Now, as we said before, we all have a natural lordotic curve. Let me just show you that. There. We all have a natural lordotic curve. But when this becomes excessive, it will lead to hyperextension of the spine and an anterior pelvic tilt. And this is also known as the lower cross syndrome. which is typically related to weak abdominals and the glutes, as well as tight erector spinae 
and tight uh, hip flexors. Let's introduce you to another postural dysfunction, hyperkyphosis, which is related to the excessive flexion of the thoracic spine. And this is particularly relevant to dentists as we spend excessive amount of time bending forward, protracting our shoulder, treating our patients. This is character characterized by an excessive thoracic spinal flexion, typically related to a protracted shoulder and a forward head posture, as well as a posteriorly tilted pelvis, leading to imbalances and weakening of the muscle that attach to the lumbar pelvic hip complex. By holding the head forward in an unbalanced position in order to gain better visibility during treatment, the cervical vertebrae can no longer adequately support the head and the muscle of the neck and the upper shoulder must contract constantly in order to support the weight of the head in the forward position. And this can result in tension neck syndrome characterized by headache and chronic pain in the neck and shoulder. Let's take a look in more detail of the effect of a forward head posture. This is frequently related to a, to a hyperkyphotic posture, and this can lead to back and neck pain because of prolonged steady posture with the head leaning forward and the shoulder protracted. The vast majority of neck strain and stiff neck is related to muscle imbalances and formation of trigger points. Now it is perhaps a bit confusing, but the major majority of neck pain is caused by trigger point in the upper back, that is the trapezius and the interscapular muscles, the rhomboid at the back. Trigger point in the neck do not cause pain in the neck themselves, it will cause pain in the head. For example, tightness of the sternocleidal mastoid does not cause pain in the muscle itself, but frontal headache is a signature head, uh, is a signature pain for sternocleidal mastoid trigger points. Let's talk about the effect of hyperkyphosis. Hyperkyphosis is also known as the upper cross pattern syndrome, which is characterized by lengthened lower trapezius and the rhomboid, protracted shoulder and shortened pectorals. So they, they become tight. The condition is worsened if you do a lot of chest workouts, such as uh, chest press or press up. Tight upper trapezius, usually related with the forward head posture. And this is typified by weakness in the deep neck flexors as well, predisposing to neck pain. Posteriorly tilted pelvis and lumbar flexion, all these muscle imbalances can predispose to neck pain as well as lower back pain. Now, in order to prevent postural dysfunction, let's see how we can improve our workplace posture. Now, let me give you some practical advice on how to reduce the risk of neck and back pain. You need to train your body so that you can recognize when you are adopting a poor posture. Start by watching yourself in the mirror or even videoing yourself. Once you have done this, you should be able to consciously, consciously correct it in your everyday routine. Correcting your posture may feel awkward initially because your body has adapted to sitting and standing in a particular way. Regular exercise, regular exercises is also important. Exercises are important because the intervertebral discs receive no blood supplies and they derive the nutrition by diffusion caused by compression and decompression. And the longer you sit or stand without moving or changing your posture, the worse it is for the disc. An optimal musculoskeletal function requires that an adequate range of motion be maintained in all the joints. That is, you need to improve your flexibility. Regular exercises, strengthening and stretching helps to maintain the mobility and flexibility of all the joints and reducing the prevalence of musculoskeletal disorders. Now, if you're unlucky enough to have hyperkyphosis, what should you do? Now, if you have hyperkyphosis, you should avoid activity which lead to further tightening of the chest muscles. 
such as TESOP PSS. Remember, hypokytosis is due to muscle imbalance. There's a tightness of the pectorals, so the chest muscle need to be stretched. And the weakened back muscles, such as the middle trapezius and the rhomboid, need to be strengthened. So how do we strengthen middle trapezius? We can do seated rows, single arm dumbbell rows, and reverse flies. Now, I don't have time to actually go through all these specific exercises, but you can actually find a lot of these exercises uh, online. You need to stretch your pectorals. What you can do is to stand in the doorway or next to the wall, bend your arm being stretched, and place the forearm flat against the wall or the door flame. Step forward and rotate your body away from the outstretched arm. Hold that between 10 to 30 seconds. You can actually stretch your pectorals and strengthen your upper back with one simple exercise that can easily be done at work. Say between patients, simply clasp your hand behind your back and retract your shoulders so you can be stretching your chest and strengthening your rhomboid and the upper trapezius at the same time, the middle trapezius at the same time. Now let's talk about the corrective exercises for hyperlordosis. Remember, uh, we are trying to correct the increased curve of the lower back. The hip plexus muscles need to be stretched along with the lower back and the glute and abdominal muscles need to be strengthened. How do we do the um, hip flexor stretch? Here is an example. Kneel on the floor with one knee bent at 90 degrees. Gently propel your hip forward, keeping the back upright until you feel a stretch of the hip flexors. And hold this for about 20 to 30 seconds and repeat this three to five times. You can do this several, time, several times a day. Lower back stretch, lie on your back, your knees bent. Pull the knees in towards your back as far as comfortable. Hold for 20 to 30 seconds and repeat three to five times. Several times a day as well. Strengthening exercise for hyperlordosis. For example, abdominal crunch. Lie on your back with your knees bent at 90 degrees. Gently slide your hand up forward towards your knees and back down again, raising only your head and shoulder off the floor, but keep your lower back on the floor. Remember, this is not sit up. You should be able to feel your abdominal muscle working hard. Initially, maybe about 10 reps, but then you can progress to more maybe uh, 15 to 20 reps. Rest for one minute and aim to complete two to three sets at least. Glute breach is particularly important for strengthening of your glute maximus. Remember, they are turned off because of the tightness of the hip flexors. Lie on your back with your knees bent at 90 degrees. Slowly raise your buttock off the floor, ensuring that you're using your glutes, but not your back or your hamstring to raise your buttock off the floor. You need to squeeze your glute tight at the top as well. Hold this for five to 10 seconds and rest and repeat. Initially aim for about two sets of 10 reps, but gradually build up to three sets of 20 reps. So when we sit, how should we sit? You should place your legs and hips around and not under the dental chair. Your thigh should not be separated for more than 30 degrees and the hip line should be horizontal. What I mean is to maintain a neutral spine all the time. The head should be tilted downward only slightly by no more than 20 degrees to bring the line from the eyes to the mouth as near vertical as possible. Ensure that the patient chair is not acting as a barrier to reach the patient's oral cavity. And you need to avoid static posture and repetitive movements. Try to alternate work position between sitting, standing, and side of patients. Take regular breaks and avoid repetitive movements. 
try to get up and move around, even doing simple exercises such as retracting your shoulder as you're waiting for anesthetic to work or setting up materials. Because repetitive movement can predispose to muscular strain and formation of trigger points. Let's talk about the positioning of the patient. Position the patient correctly, adjust the operative position to a comfortable level, and always try to maintain an upright posture that is to maintain a natural thoracic and lumbar lordotic curve. Maintain a natural thoracic kypotic and a natural lumbar lordotic curve. By positioning your chair closer to the patient, you can minimize forward bending over the patient's head. Why is good posture even more important today? Because there's an increase in likelihood that the patients are being treated in a supine position, this means dentists have to carry out treatment in a seated position. Increased position and patient expectation means that the procedure are more complicated and taking longer. For good visibility and access, dentists tend to bend the head, bend the back, over flex and twist the necks and raise the arms and shoulders. Over a long period of time, this uh, overstress the muscles and ligament, which can result in formation of trigger points, causing neck and lower back pain. I can't emphasize this enough. It is very important to select a good operator's stool. You need to select a good operator's stool so that you can maintain a neutral spine when you sit. They should have broad, not round seats with plenty of positive lumbar support. Look for an operator's stool with an anatomically shaped seat and backrest that are individually adjustable and a cylinder to match your seated lower body height. But it is still advisable to avoid prolonged sitting. Let me give you an example of a good operator's stool. The AGR campaign for healthy back seal approval has been awarded to visual evil and evil at operator stools because they allow you to separately adapt the seat service and the backrest to suit your anatomical requirements. The, uh, the elastic force of the backrest supports the lumbar muscles and medical experts from different specialist fields have evaluated and confirm the back friendly status. Now, important of good positioning cannot be overemphasized. All items needed for treatment should be within easy reach to minimize twisting and bending. Let me give you an example. The cable E80 vision. Dentist element can be positioned in any treatment position, swing arm version, of a considerable freedom of movement from 90 centimeter extension length of the instrument hoses. The cable E80 vision, its expanded air concept allows freedom of movement, comfortable leg positioning and relaxed seat position. Highest and lowest position of the patient chair from 350 to 900 millimeters. Comfortable working is possible in both seated and standing positions. Now we have to emphasize this, you know, the importance of good illumination. Adequate illumination with a focus beam and able you to look into the mouth without straining your eyes or having to bend your head forward excessively in order to gain better visibility. The cable lux 540 LED has a lockable 3D joint with variable positioning and it can be operated by the dentist element and in combination with automatic positioning of the dental chair. Now, food control is important as well. The cable multifunctional food control is operated by moving the food from the left to the right. So you don't have to raise your food, thus allowing for muscle stress free operation, even when you are standing. Both chair and handpiece functions 
can be operated from one foot control. And cordless version means that the foot control can be played wherever it is required. Last but not least, importance of good visibility. To achieve direct line of vision into the oral cavity, dentists often require to lean forward. It is only possible to perform dentistry in a neutral position if one carry out treatment using magnification, which bring the teeth closer and enable patient to be treated in a more balanced, upright position. Let me introduce you to the oroscopic loops that are designed with adjustable nose pad, bendable temple tips, anti-reflective lenses, coating, and uh, working distance refined to half an inch. Like a microscope, can be easily maneuvered and over a choice of configuration and accessories to adapt to your body frame and working preferences. Thank you very much for listening. So if you have any questions, please fire away. Thank you. Thank you. Saddle chairs, saddle chairs are exactly the same as the cable chair. They will promote you to sit with a upright posture. Basically, what, what I mean is that when you're sitting upright, you maintain a neutral spine, so you're not straining your uh, your, um, your 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 muscle, the soft tissue. But most importantly, you should avoid sitting for a prolonged period. So you should be standing up all the time. And as a result of that, you can do some exercises such as clasping your hand behind your back, stretching your front and uh, strengthening your back. Most importantly, remember to stretch your hip flexors and strengthen your glute as well. Head position where the patient should be. Yes, would I be able to, would you be able to send me an email so I can actually email you the presentation? So if you send me an email, I'm going to email you the presentation later. Thank you. Any more questions? I think you know, what, what I'm trying to get at is that prolonged sitting is very detrimental and the most important thing that we have to do is to stretch the hip flexors and strengthen your glutes. That's what I have been doing over the past year. When we are talking about standing position or sitting position, any posture is good as long as you change your posture constantly. Sitting is okay as long as you're not sitting with a steady posture all the time. Standing is okay, but standing for a prolonged period is detrimental as well. So we have to change our posture all the time. That's what I'm trying to get at. Any static posture is bad for you. Whether it is standing or sitting, we have to change the posture all the time. Ah, acupuncture is for symptomatic relief of muscle pain. Remember, muscle pain is mostly caused by formation of trigger points, and trigger, point pain, trigger points can be released through myofascial release. If you are interested, please send me an email because I've got an article on uh, self-myofascial release, which is particularly useful to eradicate trigger points, such as foam rolling or using a um, trigger point ball. They're very, very useful. But uh, I've got an article on that, so please send me an email. I'm going to email you the article. I don't think acupuncture, acupuncture is as effective as self myofascial release because obviously uh, uh, acupuncture, you have to attend the therapist all the time, whereas myofascial release, you can do it yourself at home. It's a lot cheaper. Oh, moving around between patients, absolutely. absolutely. 
I do that all the time. It is not just sitting, that is bad. It's any static posture is bad. If you're standing like this all day, it's going to create a problem as well. If you're sitting all day, it's going to create a create problem. Remember the interfertile disc receive no blood supply and they derive the nutrients by compression and decompression. So the more you move around, the better. Yeah, moving around between patients is very, very important. Any more questions? If you have any more questions, please send me an email a little bit later. And uh, I can point you the articles on my self myofascial release, which will explain to you the mechanism of uh, releasing trigger points and how how it can be done correctly. Thank you very much in participating, and I look forward to hearing from from you. Thank you. We would like to thank our speaker for sharing his knowledge and expertise with us today. We would also like to thank our sponsor for making this online course possible. And thank you, our wonderful audience, for your interest and participation. The CE quiz is now available online on the course page and completing it will allow you to earn your ADA SERP CE credits. The recording will be posted online within the next 48 hours. You will receive an email notification with a link to the recording. Thank you again, take care and goodbye.